Okay, the recording is started, and uh, I'll take any questions right now. If there's any questions before we get started, any any other questions, you can unmute and ask me. Hi, sorry. Good evening. I just wondered, your extension is it applicable for everyone? My yes. Oh, yeah. It's, it'll be it'll be open for everyone. Yes. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll get started, and and what I'm going to talk about is you know is organizational structure, and and a lot of times we say, well, what does that have to do with management principles? But structure has a is a, is a way to focus on managing properly, and that's why it's all uh, uh, it, it all comes together. So you'll have theorists that will use structure as a mechanism to be able to do. Uh, uh, you know, a different type of management and uh, especially around, you know, efficiency and effectiveness. I mean, that's been around for a long time now, you know, ever since uh, Frederick Taylor. So, so um, that's where it started. So there is a, 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 a very um, a strong connection between how a, a different organizational structure will allow you uh, to, to manage effectively given the situation you know, like situational management, given what's going on in the environment, given the type of industry that you're in and given the type of company that you're running and the products and services that you're providing. So, so it's very, very relevant. And what I want to bring your attention to is that, you know, as we go into, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence age, uh, this network structure uh, is going to become more and more prevalent you know, and, and especially again, along with the increase in global trading, because uh, global trading is, is still growing at leaps and bounds and more and more even developing countries are getting into that. And we know this, that 98% uh, 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 of businesses in Canada are small and medium sized business and they're global traders. So so it, it's, it's all going, you know, in that same direction. So, so be mindful of network structures because that's where you can take on a group of specialists or a contractor and they could do a specific amount of work and then and then you get that work done and then you know you can uh, then you can stop dealing with them or uh, you know uh, reassign them to another part of, of your project or whatever. So uh, that's what's so important around organizational structure itself. okay so that's where that is. Uh, but again, I just want to, uh, uh, again, bring it to the test. So the test, what I'll do then is I'm going to extend the duration of access uh, to not only October 3rd, but October 4th as well. And then that way, people who want to do that test on the Friday, uh, they're, they're more than welcome to do that. And the approach that I've been taking is that, you know, that the, the main areas of study are the commentary presentations. And this, this is what I'm on right now, right? This is a uh, uh, the the commentary presentation for topic four and the and the e-text uh, um, powerpoints and uh, and you take a look in the course outline you know which um, powerpoints are related to you know uh, topics one and four one two four that will be on the test and uh, you know I have a list of it you know so so far there's uh, Robin's chapter one Robin's chapter three and there's two supplemental. Uh, chapters 1B and 1C. 1C is the entrepreneur chapter. And then chapter 5, I'm going to really emphasize. And, and that's why I actually put the link on here. Uh, you know, I don't have the links for the others. Uh, but, you know, they're in your your, your weekly commentary uh, uh, folder on Blackboard. And you can access them. So go through the, you know, topics 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, for the test. Then pull them out and study them. But this, this um, particular... Uh, 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 chapter five of Robbins is jam packed with information uh, that can help you on the test. And not only that, it will help you on participation 4B. And uh, you're going to see how uh, the I just uploaded it, a new version of topic four in the weekly commentary for for um, uh, topic four and, and, and insist that, you know, for 4B, you have your team review that um, that entire presentation, it's it's just it has all the elements of structure in it so that when you're going to create a structure for your chosen company uh, that you picked in in the, in in topic three, uh, you know, you'll have show me some elements of what you've learned there. All right. OK. And, and then the next thing is there's practice tests 
as well. And I actually put the link on here to those pra practice tests that you can access. Uh, but uh, there, uh, uh, I believe now that th they are on topic four as well. I think there's about three of them. And, and what I want to uh, tell you about is that it, they don't necessarily reflect, like if you just studied the practice test, you wouldn't have all the material to, to be successful on the test. But what you will have when you do the practice test is get a sense of what those questions will look like. And, and again, you know, I've got, a, I've got a copy of the announcements for the test. There's not going to be any computational type questions. You know, it's all content that you have to do. So, so those are the, the, the key things is go through the commentaries, uh, take a look at, you know, what's been highlighted in those commentaries in terms of what to focus on for studies. It's either, a, you know, a yellow highlight or there's a lot of uh, emboldened uh, 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 lettering that, you, you know, would allow you to, to say, oh, yeah, I better do a little more study around that. Studying these, the, these um, uh, uh, PowerPoints, you know, from the e-text will really give you a, a good sense. Uh, and then look at those practice tests and then, then go into the Blackboard topic slide tech uh, you know, to kind of see if there's any more detail that you should know about. Uh, and, and then, you know, if you if you're really, you know, not so uh, uh, if, if you need more clarity, you know, go to the video presentations inside of those topics. And lo and behold, if you go to the last page on the course outline, you're, you're going to see, you know, uh, which chapters are related to, uh, you know, which topics. And then, you know, if you decide you want to read some things, you go into the e-text and, and read that as well. So this is the approach, all right? But, you know, it starts here. I mean, this is the most important part right here, okay? Okay, uh, so again, uh, you know, just this slide deck here, here for chapter five, here's the link to it. It's a must. I mean, there's so much rich information here for this topic uh, that it covers you know, a, you know uh, a big portion of the content that you're going to need for the test and, and to really understand an organizational uh, structure. Okay, so I wanted to tell you what I learned about organizational structure uh, because the, some of the things I'm going to tell you about really I haven't seen in any textbooks. This is, you know, from, you know, uh, just nuts and bolts, hard knock, you know, experience learning. And and so I'll, I'll go over these things as, you know, uh, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, form follows function. So what does that mean? It means that you got to know what you're going to do first, and then you organize to it. If you organize before, and I've been in a lot of organizations that they, they had traditional uh, organizational structures because that's what they were doing for 50 years. And, and uh, you know, especially in uh, Ontario Hydro Nuclear when I was there, you know, the Ontario Hydro has been around for a long time and they're very regimented and very bureaucratic. And, and the thing is, there would be an issue and, and right away they, they reorganize rather than say, OK, well, what do we really want to achieve? What's our purpose? And if you went that way, then you're organizing with purpose and then you'll be a lot more effective and a lot more rigorous in dealing with the, the area. So, so what is function? In, in my experience now, it's, it's a combination of understanding your organization's value proposition. And again, I'm hoping for some of you, most of you know what a value proposition is, but that's, you know, what value is your offering bringing to the customers? And you really need to understand that because that will tell you where, you know, where the focus should be. And when you know where the focus should be, you organize for that focus. All right. So you need to understand the organization's value proposition. And that's, you know, what what you're offering customers, because that's what's keeping them up at, at awake at night. And then that's going to solve their problems. And it's a solution. Along with that is the strategy and then the business model. Right. And most small businesses don't really articulate their own business model. It's in their head and they really can't describe it. But if you lay out the business model along with the strategy uh, and then know what you're trying to offer, now you have the function. This is what you're going to do, all right, uh, uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, for, for your customer base. And, and that, then you can, you can set up that structure accordingly. And, and again, uh, here's here's another thing that I learned. You never get it right the first time. You never get the ultimate organizational structure, especially if you're you know a growing business and you've started from being an entrepreneur. So it takes 
a learning organization. And there's a lot of information around the learning organization. And there's one slide in particular in that chapter five e-text uh, is, uh, is Peter Senge. And Peter Senge was the pioneer around what a learning organization is. And, and I'll just give you a little story about that, all right? So I've done a lot of strategic planning uh, with, with organizations. And, and what I tell the, or, you know, the people that, that are around uh, the coming in to do the plan is that I would rather have a half-baked uh, strategic plan, you know, 50% kind of thing, uh, uh, assigned to a learning organization because then they can learn what's going on and adapt rather than have a 100% you know, perfect plan and an organization that doesn't know how to learn and doesn't know how to adapt to the situation. And here's where Henry Mintzberg comes in. You know, Henry Mensberg is one of the theorists that we've been covering in this course. You know, he's in, at McGill University. Uh, he's a world-renowned expert in, in strategy, in strategic planning, and happens to be an expert in organizational planning. And, and what uh, uh, Mintzberg talks about is, you know, a realized strategy. So uh, I'll get to the next slide here, all right? Um, so, so just to, you know, put a placeholder there. So, so really it gets back to, you know, this is one of the drawings I've done way back in 2018, you know, in my, my, uh, my practice here, uh, um, uh, Crytel, you know, I call them business knowledge maps. This is the crux of what's going on. I mean, you set strategy, you know, to create competitive advantage, but it's based on the value proposition, what are you offering to the customer? And oh, by the way, as you set up that initial uh, uh, value proposition, you're already laying the terms for the strategy that you're going to adopt by understanding you know, how you're going to bring things to your customer. But what's really important is that you need to understand the business model as well. And, and I'll get to those uh, explanations. So here's the thing about you know uh, uh, Peter Senge, all right? This is you know the, what I'd ask you to do, and if it, it, you you'll do yourself some service if you you know continue in this stream of uh, you know career in terms of uh, understanding planning and and working in in large and small organizations to understand what a learning organization is, and uh, you know here's some. Uh, um, characteristics of the learning organization. That's all I'm going to talk about. But it's it's a, the 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 outcome of a learning organization is that they learn on the fly and they and they recalibrate and they and they hone that original strategy that they've started. You know as they go through. So at the end of the day, all right, you want to develop a structure, but it's the learning organization that picks up the. The clue. So you start with an intended strategy, and this is a Mintzberg strategy model, by the way. You start with an intended strategy, but you start hitting the realities of the market that you're working in, and and what comes out of it. You know, all these like different uh, barriers and and challenges and opportunities. You know, they 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 come to a point where you can start figuring. Aha! Here's how we recalibrate that intended strategy, and you come up with a realized strategy. And it's the learning organization that can do this in the best way to do that. And then that's part of the, you know, the, the component to be able to structure your organization uh, to be, uh, and, you know, effective in getting, you know, servicing your 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 customers. And and the thing here is that here's, uh, you know, the value proposition that I talked about. You know, so you know, knowing your target market, you know how you're creating a competitive advantage. Uh, you, you know what the tangible benefits are, and and I'm going to talk about you know a, a value proposition canvas. You know my famous uh, or my friend here, uh, um, uh, Osterwalder, who developed a, a a value proposition canvas, and this is his business model canvas. And 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 the whole idea then is that you know you know what your business model is, so you know where you make your money and where you spend your money. And if you know where you make your money and spend your money, then you're going to structure your organizations to be more effective that way. And then at the end of the day, you've got you know uh, based on a realized strategy. Sometimes it takes you two, three, uh, four years to really hone that strategy to where it's it's really connecting with the uh, with, with the, the the response of the market. Uh, and and then you finally get to that structure that's that's um, you know that that that's the best you can probably get to. And again, you know you still have to watch the environment and see what's changing and and uh, and move on the fly. So that's what that's all about. So form, you know the structure, 
follows function. You got to figure out all these things, you know, all, all these things, you know, before you get to that form. So form follows function, right? And in this digital world, it's even more important, you know. So, so how does a certain thing need to function? You know, what does the end user need that thing to do before setting out to design it? You know, so it's unlikely uh, to function optimally for specific purpose if you don't, you know, if you don't uh, know the why, you don't know the react the actual purpose. Uh, uh, so, so that's where you start. You know, is is the why? You know, why are we doing this, and how are we doing this, and that's how you're going to get to that that piece. Okay. So, uh, any questions about that? Okay, any questions at all? Um, okay, I don't see anything on the chat. Okay, so I'm going to take it uh, to the, I, I just want to talk about assignment number two again, okay? So, I want to remind you that um, when you, you know, and Assignment number two is an individual assignment as well. And, you know, it's due, I think, October the 21st, right? And um, let's see. Yeah. Um, just want to confirm that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's due on October 21st. So what I want you to do is, I want you to, you know, look at this brief history of management, know your theorists and your theories, and that's going to be helpful in test number one as well. So the sooner you get started on this assignment, you know, you'll actually be, you know, studying for this test as well. And, and here's, you know, it's a Google Doc, so you download that. And, and this is this, you know, manager style self audit, and, you know, it's worth 10% of your final marks. And before you start that assignment, this link will take you to about three articles that really, um, uh, enlightens you about the things that we're going to ask you to to uh, respond to in in that assignment. So you'll really get a sense of of you know what what you need to talk about. Uh, and then then the next one is that document that I created where you're connecting the Revel survey to management theories. So each one of those surveys, I've shown you which theorist really connects to it so that you'll get a sense of, you know, what can help you go through that list. You know, it's a list of about 30, 30 plus uh, surveys to see how, you know, maybe there's a few that you want to do ahead of time to be able to get a better insight on how to how to deal with assignment number two. Um, and, and then and then there's the, the document, you know, theorist tools and techniques. Uh, and, and that way you'll see how that that theorist created the theory that developed management principles that found itself uh, in, in uh, to re resulting in a creation of a tool, and that's why we're we're working with the tools in the participation activities, uh, and and those are the things that you're going to use to be able to manage effectively as you go forward. And it's not just you know, maybe some of you may not even land up in a business, but you will land up in an organization and you'll still be using some of these tools to be able to make, you know, better management decisions. OK, so so that's where uh, that's where that is. OK, um, any questions about that uh, again? And again, you know, please, you know, I've got this um, um, uh, uh, discussion forum, you know, ask Coach Gary. Send me a question there and let uh, you know, send me an email saying, you know, I have this question for you. I will answer it and then I, you know, I'll post to say that I've answered it and then you could help all your colleagues as well. So any questions? Okay, are we okay? Can I see some thumbs up? Are we all doing okay? Let me see some thumbs up. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, so I, 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 here's another thing is that I, I hope that I can help you with some of my experience uh, and, and, and so that you can take some of these ideas with you, you know, as you leave this program. And so what I what I'm going to be doing, uh, you know, uh, in some of these topics is I talk about my helpful hints, hopefully. All right. And uh, here's an article that I came across and uh, and I just wanted to make the case for, you know, it's, you know, don't type write, you know, and writing has a, a, a better uh, uh, connectivity, you know, with the, you know, that with the different brain regions so that you will retain more if you're doing taking notes, all right, rather than just typing away. So, so you might want to read this article. Here's the link. That's what this is all about. 
Uh, and uh, and again, you know, if you do try it and you have some results, please let me know. Put it on, uh, you know, uh, ask Coach Gary uh, uh, on the discussion forum and and, uh, and share that with your, uh, you know, with your colleagues as well. Okay. So again, now there's some so there's some survey deliverables for topic four, and there's three of them. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and and again, look at, you know, one is on organizational structure assessment. Uh, the other one is on effective empowerment and engagement. And the other one is on dele delegation and, and self-assessment. And again, these are all, you know, baseline surveys that, uh, you know, will we'll show you where you are. And, and to be able to set up a good development plan for yourself, you know, essentially it's like, where are you now? All right, where do you want to be? What's that gap? And then your goals kind of just fall out. So, you know, you're doing a gap analysis. And the first part of doing that gap analysis is really collecting a good baseline on, on, uh, on yourself, on your capabilities, you know, on your tendencies, uh, you know, on your predominant um, uh, behaviors and those kind of things. And, and that's, that will help you. I mean, organizations spend thousands of dollars uh, to to uh, survey, you know, their talent as they want to move them up the organization. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you. So don't, you know, like keep that information. Don't 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 let that go. You know, you can go back to it and then get a sense of how you've moved, you know, from some of these different survey uh, uh, attributes that you've taken. All right. OK, so here's uh, just the, you know, um, the, the practice tests that are in topic four. You know, there's there's three tests. They're not your only study focus. As I said, they're going to really give you a sense of how the questions are asked, you know, as far as representing the content in the tests, not so much. All right. So don't don't put all your eggs in this basket. And then the last thing is on the, on the delegation self-assessment. You know, this is stuff that's going to help you on your team member review on assignment five. So pay some attention to that and keep notes on, on that piece as well. All right. Uh, so I'm just uh, going to mute everybody here because uh, we've got a few that aren't muted. Let me see. Um, where are we here? OK, we're all muted now, so it's all good. OK, so so any questions about that? OK, we're all good. Thumbs up. OK, all right, and and then now let's talk about test number one. All right. So what you're going to need for uh, test number one is you're going to need your web webcam operate operating, and you're going to need the latest version of the lockdown browser. Okay. And um, th this is an old uh, illustration, but you'll see in the uh, navigation panel. I think it's just under lockdown browser uh, on on our blackboard, our course blackboard, and you click on that, and you're going to get a whole pile of information on that. Okay. And, and uh, just a, a, a warning to people who have a Chromebook, uh, the Chromebook is not set up as robustly, uh, you know, for lockdown browser as, you know, other devices. So there's certain things that you have to know about the Chromebook and, uh, and so that they're, they're in these instructions, but they're listed out here. And again, um, on, on the, um, I, I want you to, to, to do a, um, you know, a practice run through and there's this test that you can do, and uh, and you can find that in topic five. You're not going to get marked on it, but it, it will mark your test just because it's a test. Uh, it's it's not going into your your final marks or anything. But if you click on that, you can actually practice. You know, uh, um, you know, to to test that that your lockdown uh, browser is working and your webcam is working, and that will help you. All right. And again, if you go to all this information that's under lockdown browser. It doesn't say 2023 anymore. It just says lockdown browser. You know, the library can help you in that area as well. OK, so that that's really important, especially if you're a Chromebook user. And please get this done before you get into the test. You won't get into the test if your lockdown browser is not uh, working properly. OK, any questions about that? You can type a message on chat. I'm just looking at the chat right now to see if there's anything or if any of you wants to unmute and ask me, that's fine. We OK? Thumbs up. That thumbs up here. OK, show me some emoticons. OK, good. Thank you. All right. So test number one online, uh, uh, you access it through topic five. 
And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to extend this from 8 a.m. on October 3rd to uh, 11 p.m. on October 4th, Friday. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to do that. I'll send out a message, you know, to uh, to update this. The test content is in topics one, two, three, and four. You know, I told you how to study for this. You know, the key things are, you know, the the topic commentaries and the um, and the PowerPoint. Uh, um, uh, slide decks that are, you know, the e-text, and they're all in in your folders, you know, under, uh, you know, weekly topics. The nature of it, it's uh, 50 multiple choice and true and false questions, predominantly multiple choice. I'm guessing maybe there's maybe six or seven true or false questions. The rest are all multiple choice. Um, and again, here's the link, you know, to this. This is what it looks like. It, what it is, there's a notice just above it that says what it is, and then you go into this assessment test, and, and again, it says that you need uh, a respondents lockdown browser. OK, so that's that's uh, that's related to the test. OK. All right. Uh, OK, uh, you know, again, there's the link to the uh, the, the uh, uh, practice test, you know, for the lockdown browser uh, to be able to do that. And uh, I'm just going to ask you again, you know, are any questions about everything that I told you so far? We all good? OK. All right, so. Um, in in the you know, we we uh, I'm going to talk about Rita McGrath a little bit, but, you know, we've gone, you know, through this. Uh, um, yeah, historical uh, view of how management uh, theory and principles have uh, have evolved. OK, and and, uh, you know, the, the next wave is is going to be all about empathy and the better way to approach empathy is to really understand triple bottom line and triple bottom line is all about planet the environment people you know society and the impact of society on what uh, uh, organizations have and then profit and we we put it in terms of prosperity and and so back in the 70s it was all about uh, you know bottom line and that was profit and uh, no matter you know people organizations were not responsible and now uh, because you know, by 2050, we're going to need three Earths of of resources to uh, to um, uh, keep us going at the rate that we're going, and we don't have three Earths, so you know, sustainability becomes more important. But the whole idea around triple bottom line is empathy. It's caring, right? And it's looking at being a good ancestor. So you know, that's that's why I want to give you a little bit of of introduction. You know, it wasn't designed just to do accounting. It's to provoke deeper thinking around capitalism and the future, right? So, so that's key. That's key what uh, Triple Bottom Line is. And it's a transformation framework, you know, and, and it's, it's more towards, you know, a regenerative or, or sustainable future. And, and tri uh, Triple Bottom Line has, you know, there's a lot of organizations now that are going in that area and they have some really good systems and some benchmarks to to look at. So as you're looking, you know, and when you're getting into your career and you're looking at new methods of of managing and you're going to get into that next wave based on all the impact that artificial intelligence and robotics is is going to have on just about every field, then you really need to look at it in a different way. And uh, and and you you know, you have to you have to look at it that way. OK, so it considers all stakeholders. And it's tied into corporate social responsibility, and we're going to talk about that in the later in the later topics, because um, corporate social responsibility now is a way to do business. And oh, by the way, the consumer, the client, the customer is a lot more informed, and you know makes choices based on you know corporate social responsibility, and and has to see that reflected in the brand of the organization, right? So why am I telling you all this? Is because ultimately, you know, organizational structure has to accommodate, you know, to be able to 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 do uh, a good corporate social responsibility. Okay. So you know, so public opinion, consumer purchasing power, the speed of and transparency of information. You know, you, you can't hide it anymore. There's people out there, you know, there's NGOs like non-government organizations that are tracking polluters. They're tracking, you know, social uh, um, uh, deviants, I guess, organizations that are not doing it right or exploiting workers. 
And, and the thing is, is that stakeholders are rewarding the organization's positive impacts and reprimanding the negative. So it's profitable is what I'm telling you, right? Okay, uh, so prosperity considers economic indicators over which an organization or business has influence, but you know, the, there's livable wages, ethical sourcing, workplace health and safety, you know, and triple bottom line theory is it's it's systemic. So it, it and and how do you make it systemic? Is they organize it through structure. I mean, that's what systemic means, right? It's in the system. So just to give you an idea of what's out there, I mean, there are ethical investment stocks, and and there are companies that that um, that that put their stocks on the market, and they're environmental, social, and 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 have governance uh, uh, to be able to demonstrate that they're doing the right things. And the consumer will buy those kind of ethical investments rather than buy just regular stocks. So you can see that things are changing. All right, you can change. You know, things are changing. Uh, where did I go here? All right. Um, okay. Um, and and. Uh, so I, I don't want to belittle this or just go over it here, but uh, but again, you're going to see a lot about ESG in, in the future here. And that's going to be part of, you know, the new management uh, um, uh, philosophies going forward. You know, so there's going to be three pillars, you know, environmental factors, social factors and governance factors. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, governance, you know, that is, you know, board diversity and executive compensation and shareholder rights. And that all manifests itself in policy, and policy drives organizational structure. Okay, uh, so there's all kinds of benefits. Uh, I'm not going to go through that right now, but there are challenges. You know, right now, uh, you know, uh, triple bottom line is has a fair low recognition, but you know there are leaders in the field, and especially you know in Canada. Uh, you know, if you take a look at um, uh, um, Van City Credit Union as a leader in uh, in corporate social responsibility, and has actually you know uh, uh, made some world impact on you know their knowledge and uh, and their best practices, and and they've shared them with people. Uh, so so there's those kind of things that go on, but it's all about becoming good ancestors and. Uh, you know, so start paying attention to the environment that brings out slower, longer term. Imagine them thinking about choices we're making for ourselves and our and our future generations. All right, and and we need to be accountable, and it starts with ourselves. And all you people are are you know are the future leaders. Uh, so you know you will all you know all of you will have a a part to play in this piece, and it all comes down to empathy. All right, and how do you make a personal empathetic connection? With future generations, whom we never can meet, but you know our grandchildren's grandchildren. Do we want them to have the same, you know, blessings and and benefits that we have today? Well, we need to do something about that because you know we're we're uh, you take a look at climate change and you know where that's heading. Uh, so, uh, lady by the name of Rita McGrath, you know, uh, if organizations existed in execution area, we talked about that. So, you know, that's the Frederick Taylors and. And then get into you know the behavioral part. Where we're heading is it's got to be a complete and meaningful experience for that customer, and it's a new era of empathy. So I wanted to kind of you know uh, introduce that. I'm going to be talking about that as we as we go along. Uh, but um, you know the, uh, the, that's I'm hoping that you'll have some appreciation you know for triple bottom line as we as we go through this. Uh, this course, and I mean, this is what it looks like. Okay, yeah, and it's you know, it's all about you know, um, people, planet, and 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 profit, which you know translates into prosperity, and uh, so it's social, economic, and environmental, and that's what triple bottom line is is all about. Okay, so any questions about triple bottom line at all, or anybody want to share anything? You know, have you have you seen it before? Have you uh, you know have you have you experienced, uh, you know, maybe a company that went out of its way to do something or is really protective of the environment or, or uh, you know, those kind of things? How are we doing? OK, no questions. I'll go ahead. Get going. Can I see some thumbs up? OK, all right. OK. So let's talk about you know the participation activities, 
right? So, so uh, what what um, you know what I want you to do on the four A, and again, four uh, A and four B are group team exercises, and and just answer the following questions briefly, you know, and that's based on you know uh, you chose this organization in topic three and three A, and then. So the organization that you you have chosen, what's their organization mandate? You know, what is the role and the vision of the organization? And the thing is, again, you know, that's what really kind of gets you to understanding. Well, how does it need to be structured if it has a particular type of vision? You know, you know and then what's a good thing that the, this organization you know will do or has done? You know, because you could pick an existing organization if you want. And what's a bad thing? And all from a triple bottom line perspective, all right? You know, people, planet, and prosperity. So that's why I introduced this uh, triple bottom line to really give you some context about how to think about uh, this organization, okay? And then topic 4B, uh, I'm asking you again, the first thing that you do is review chapter five, you know, organizational structure, um, you know, uh, and, and before you design, you know, that particular structure. Because what I'm hoping is that you're going to pick up on some certain aspects of that, you know, and, and we're going to talk about these, you know, further on in this presentation. But you're going to see we're going to talk about span of control and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, you know, direct supervision. We're going to talk about decentralization versus uh, uh, um, concentration and, and those kind of things. All right. So 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 based on your choice on topic three, activity three, a create this organizational structure. And remember, I've asked you to, you know, uh, in in participation three, to have this this organization at least larger than five people, so you've got some substance to to reflect in your organizational chart. And please, you know, uh, do it on a, on a software, right? Not hand drawn, right? And label it properly. Uh, and and comment on the organization's degree of centralization. Uh, comment on the the organization's degree of specialization. Um, how jobs are formally divided. And all this information is right in this presentation. So you'll be able to get it all in one spot. I mean, it's all over in, you know, in the topic slide deck. It's all over in the in this commentary slide deck. But this chapter five really brings it all together. So not only will it help you do a good job in designing your organizational structure for topic 4B, uh, but you're going to get some good uh, studying for, the, for test number one. OK. All right. So any questions about the assignments? And again, they're both due, you know, next Monday, right? Uh, so they're always the, you know, the following Monday before, you know, the the Tuesday webinar. Okay, and I hope your teams are, uh, uh, you know, are are gelling right now and getting together. And uh, you know, I'll start looking at some of the, um, you know, the uh, the learning team charters as they come in, and uh, and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. OK, so here's some organizational chart examples. You know, there's there's different types of structures and why? Because there's different types of organizations. So there's all these things that come into play. You know, uh, what industry are you in? What type of business are you in? What type of customers are you trying to uh, uh, service? Um, what are the you know, what are the conditions of that business? And, and all that uh, comes to play on on uh, and again, of finding the customer where the customer is, and and that has uh, an impact on um, on the on the kind of structures. So uh, I'll give you an example. All right. So I work for Ontario Hydro Nuclear. All right. And and in Ontario Hydro Nuclear, I mean, if there was one pump for doing something, uh, there was two more. You know, as backup. So they called that uh, you know uh, triple redundancy. That's what they called it. And and it was a hierarchical structure. Why? Because it you know it it was very rigid, and there was very strict uh, policies and very strict operating procedures with very strict operating limits. Why? Because of the, the you know the risks, loss of life, uh, you know, uh, damage of you know uh, billions of dollars. Right. So a hierarchical structure. You know, it's still in use today. I mean, that started way back in Frederick Taylor, uh, Taylor's uh, days, uh, but it it needs that discipline and it needs that control and, and that centralization to make sure that things happen right. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, all right, 
uh, you know, you probably will have, you know, uh, maybe a, a horizontal flat structure. You're the owner uh, and you're doing it all in terms of the planning and the, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the approach and the investing. And then you have different people below you that are doing things. And, and that's more of what they call, you know, um, an organic or uh, 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 organization or a, uh, what they call an ad hocracy. I mean, it's like a gong show. You know, everybody just does what they have to do to make this business successful. So there's different organization structures for different applications, right? That's what you have to remember. Uh, and, and here, you know, I work in, in matrix structures. <laughs> and really what that is, is that's several uh, departments or, or organizations or companies that, uh, that offer different representatives under one project manager or one, one uh, overall leader. And, uh, and it's because uh, they're trying to um, um, bring in all the diversity and the knowledge and the the and satisfy the issues of all those participating organizations. All right. So when it runs well, it runs really well, and everyone gets represented, and the customer gets what they need out of all this. But what could happen is that you you've heard this tale about it's you know uh, it's it's hard to serve two masters, and uh, the, you know the people inside of this structure right here. Well, they. Um, uh, you know, they, they have their boss in that organization that's being representative, and then they have their boss who's running the, you know, the project or, or the initiative. And sometimes there's conflict. And I've been there and uh, it could get, you know, it, it, it gets pretty complicated. You know, I know that I, I had pressures from my boss put on me, wanting me to drive the agenda, you know, to satisfy the organization I was working for, which put a lot of pressure on myself stress but not only that um sort of uh, uh put pressures on on uh really um uh, uh affecting the the overall uh mandate of, of of the matrix structure organization to make it work and come out with the right outcomes you know so it compromised you know some of the approach uh going through so those are the kind of things that you know you you have to think about okay all right so yeah, you know, I uh, want you to do an organizational chart, you know, to look at this. Uh, and, and again, if you go to this link, Smart Draw, it'll show you, uh, you know, a few things. You know, you can use that if you like. Um, and, and also, organizational structure, you know, um, impacts layout in an organization. So uh, I'll give you an example, All right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I had a project that I worked for a, a federal development and they asked me to go in and uh, do a business evaluation of a welding and, and assembly uh, operation. Uh, that was one of their clients because they, they, they loaned money to that piece. And what had happened was the owner, entrepreneur, really smart person, um, he managed to get this um, uh, uh, computer automated uh, stamping machine. It was worth, you know, a couple of million bucks and he got it on a clearance and uh, and he could make, uh, you know, different stamp products at incredible profit, right? But what happened was it was a large machine, all right? And what did they do? They put it snap dab in the middle of their operations in their building. And, and because of that layout, the workflows of the other products were compromised. So, so you know, you've got to take it all into consideration. What business are we in and, and how, you know, what, you know, what functions do we have to satisfy and then how do we organize that properly and then, then how do we have the, the right layout to have, you know, a very um, efficient and effective, you know, workflow. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, that's what impacts profitability and quality. So, so those are the kind of things that, you know, that, that are all related into organizational structure. Uh, so you know, I'm taking you through the different types of, of layout, and uh, we're going to talk about a, a process layout. So remember that a process layer, uh, layout, it's similar items are grouped together, all right? So they're ideal for companies that perform custom work. Uh, so, so what they'll do is, is that um, it, it, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll, they'll bring uh, these, um, these machines or whatever and together uh, because they can do something. But a product layout, that's where equipment, tools, and machines are located according to how a product is made. 
So if you're producing vinegar, all right, you know, uh, the, the, the product layout is that the equipment is put in, you know, in, in, a, in a process, sorry, in a, in a, in a line of operation uh, where we're making vinegar is, you know, it's, it, there's not very many variables, right? It's one, it's one product. Uh, and, and so that, so that it, the, the really, the main objective is efficiency and, and, and effectiveness. Uh, whereas on a process layout, it's more about sometimes you have to do batch uh, because it's it's around uh, um, similar items that are grouped together, and, and and I'll show you that in a piece. So 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 let's just let's show uh, you know on the on the process design. So if you um, if you have a high variety, um, then you need a very flexible shop. All right, so appliance repair would be. But if you're you know if you're producing you know pure water. Well, uh, you know that you know uh, cost is really important, and uh, and then it's continuous. It's very uh, inflexible, you know, because it's uh, you know it, it's all about unit production. So this is like consistency and continuous, and this is like batch in terms of being having to be very flexible. So that's where you're going from, you know, um, uh, you know, on on the process, uh, you know, uh, uh, versus the products. Okay. So, so here's the, the four types of, 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 of layouts. There's a fixed layout. So this is where, you know, a shipbuilding or, or building a plane, you know, it's in one location. That's why they call it a fix. So everything comes to the plane, you know, in terms of materials and in terms of people. And then there's, there's the process that I talked about. So what you will have then, you'll have the various types of equipment that comes together to make it efficient, you know, uh, to produce that. And then you know you have the the cellular, and we're going to talk about cellular because cellular uh, um, is is a lot more common in today's manufacturing because you you can start and finish the product in one area, and there's different ways of doing cells, and it depends again on the product and and the industry, but uh, it gives you the most flexibility because the workers are together, and then they can they can uh, uh, transfer their skills to each other and and cover you know a lot better. Uh, and, and then on the product, it's an assembly line, and things are are you know broken down to the smallest item, uh, and and um, you know if one p you know if one part of the assembly goes down, the whole assembly line goes down on on the on the product uh, layout. Okay, so so that's that's what that's all about. Okay, so uh, fixed position, process layout, you know operating room, everything comes to the patient, right? So uh, workers and equipment come to site, complicating factors like limited space and different materials are required and those kind of things. Uh, on a process, you know, then, you know, you might have, uh, you know, say a carpentry shop. Well, all the table saws are together, you know, so all the sawing gets done, you know, and then all the drilling gets done, you know, so that's the process piece, right? So flexible and capable of handling a wide variety of products and services. Again, you know, they're sort of a lot more along the batch uh, part. And then the cellular, it's it's um, the machines and the equipment are, are, are all together. And these U-shape work cells are the most efficient uh, because, you know, the people can cover for each other on what's going on. And, and what you see is, you know, it goes from input to actual, you know, finished product output, you know, to get to, to get things done. OK, so so back to uh, organizational structures. Um, you know, it's how job tasks are formally formally divided and how they're grouped and coordinated. So that's what organizational structures are all about. And then the layout is just another extension of that organizational structure on how you actually get this, this done. OK, uh, so, you know, so when you look at organizational design, you know, uh, the, the, the structure piece is a big component as well as, you know, the, the, the other factors of the type of people and how you train them, the technology that you're using, and then the environment that you're in, you know, based on the industry and the type of business and whatever. Okay. So again, that's, you know, that's the layout piece of that. So any questions about, you know, the layout related to organizational structure? Okay. So we've come a long way, right? We've, we've come from, all right, here's a theory, you know, and, and, and here's the principles of the theory. And those principles are of, of the management theory, you know, relate to finding the right structure 
to actually organize people and jobs and outputs right in inside of you know those those particular layouts uh, and and, uh, and then based on the conditions of, of what's going on so so now when you look at that you you, uh, you look at um you know uh okay so how much do we centralize so remember i told you in that in that uh, nuclear power plant that I worked in, that was a you know that was a bureaucracy, and uh, all everything was centralized. You know the the decision making was made from the top, and and uh, you know it made for you know uh, like a lot of authority you know uh, going going down, and because of that, there's less communication uh, um, that that that's required to make decisions because they're all being made at the top, and for for obvious reasons of. You know reliability and safety and and uh, you know uh, uh, loss prevention. All right. So so how do you determine that? You know what's the determination of of being central? Well, it's a number of contacts. Uh, you know it's it's uh, you know the, the you know what's shared between you know people A and C and how are they connected and how close you know uh, through through that piece. So so again, let's talk about organizational structure. It's the backbone. Uh, you know of the operating procedures and the workflows, right? So again, you know the, the the organizational structure will dictate the layout, and the layout then will uh, dictate you know how things get done, operating procedures, and 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 the layout dictates how the workflow goes through. So it's all connected. At the end of the day, this is how you manage effectively, um, you know, uh, by but by right from the 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 theory down to the policies and the procedures okay so a clear structure allows every team member to be involved and and then again to build that org structure you need to consider business size the industry you know the life cycle you know how, you know how long is this going to be around so you know if you know that um, this product is only going to sell for 10 years are you going to invest you know, in a large operation that uh, that's all mechanized and then goes obsolete. So life cycle, you know, the the, the positioning, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what kind of quality, you know, uh, all, all those kind of things. OK. Um, OK, so let me take you back now to, uh, you know, connecting triple bottom line. And, and so where, where we start is that when we start in this business, and, and, and these products, we, we look at the creative process, right? Uh, so so you, you, you prepare and, um, and then you, you, and when you're preparing, you're getting these different sources of information. And then, and then you take a step back and you, and you incubate. So, you know, you give your idea space to, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to, to launch, to see if it works. All right. And then when it's starting to work, then, you know, you have these aha moments and, and then you know where you're going. You can know what, you know, what you can really produce and how you can produce it better. And then and then you validate it. And, and the whole idea is going through this creative process, you know, allows you to get to these sustainable solutions. So what, well, you know, what am I saying? Well, if you take a look at uh, circuit boards, OK, so circuit boards, uh, you know, up until maybe 20 years ago, uh, they, they were they were um, you know they were built and uh, and there's a lot of rare earths or uh, special you know uh, elements or metals uh, that that are that are expensive and uh, and and what would happen is that all these circuit uh, circuit boards would get collected and then sent across the ocean and and have people remove them. You know, and they had all kinds of health problems, and you know, because of the you know the 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 contaminating aspects of some of those those uh, those elements that are in those circuit boards to recover those materials. Well, in 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 the in the in the new creative thinking process, they talk about okay, how do we how do we uh, uh, design this circuit board so that we can recover these pieces without affecting you know uh, people's health. And and design it such that the recovery is much easier to pull out the you know the the valuable parts of that circuit board. Look, that's all in the creative process. And what are they doing? Basically, they're doing that along triple bottom line because they're worried about the health of the people. They're worried about the environment. And oh, by the way, it's more profitable now to recover those those rare earths or those uh, minerals because 
um, you know, they could do it more effectively, right? And they could do it mechanically and those kind of things. So those are the, you know, this is why we, you know, this this also becomes, you know, part of the organizational structure process, you know, to get to layouts and and then to get to, you know, the the machines on the floor and and uh, and to be able to manage people and jobs, you know, more effectively. Okay, again, just a reminder now, you know, we talked about this, form follows function, right? So decide what you're gonna do, you know, why you're gonna do it, how you're gonna do it, and then set up the organization, you know, the organizational structure and the layout and, uh, you know, the workflow and all, all those pieces, you know, once you've decided what's really important to the customer and how are you going to manage that value proposition, you know, to ultimately, bring the most value for the less uh, cost to your um, to your customers. OK, so common types of organizational structures. So here's now we're getting into, you know, I showed you those little drawings. Well, uh, there's, you know, a word, you know, functional structure. So functional structure might be, you know, accounting. So a lot of, uh, you know, accountants that are in that functional structure and, and that's related more to efficiency and uh, and sharing of knowledge and um, uh, specialization, you know, that uh, to be able to perform at, at the peak to do something right. Uh, then divisional structure, you know, and so that's like, you know, many businesses that come together and divisional structure might be, you know, around a product or it might be around a geography. And then a matrix structure I told you about, you know, it's different organizations coming together to represent, you know, all the aspects of the needs of the organization, you know, to, to fully cover you know, a, a good value proposition for the customer. Team structure, we're going to talk about a little bit. I think everybody kind of knows about that. The network structure is what's coming, you know, in terms of, you know, you know a lot of uh, different uh, areas of organization out there that get connected, you know, over the internet, uh, you know, over different time zones, over different specialties to be able to uh, get something done. Hierarchical structure, very uh, uh, traditional structure from way back of, uh, uh, you know, Frederick Taylor's days and then a flat organization, basically the, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial uh, uh, organization that that uh, most people start when they're starting a business. But inside of that, you know, are the the basic elements of organizational structure and uh, and and the six uh, pieces. And again, this is in the chapter five uh, presentation and it's all in one place. So you'll be able to kind of work through that and study it a lot better. Um, so there's work specialization, you know, and that's, you know, uh, you know, if you can break the task down enough, uh, then, you know, you can do it more efficiently, more effectively at, at better quality rates. Uh, departmentation is that, you know, different departments will bring different functions together. Uh, chain of command is basically, you know, uh, some somebody may be at the top that we'll be talking to, you know, um, their layer of uh, uh, organization and that layer of the people in there will have an, uh, an, an organization below that. Uh, and then the span of control we're going to talk about. So uh, if I have uh, two people reporting to me, the span of control is two. If I have three people reporting to me, the span of control is three. All right. And, and that, you know, the larger the organizations with more mechanization and uh, uh, connection through software, span of control can get up to hundreds of people. So, you know, a call center is run by the computer, right? So, you know, there might be one manager and a hundred call center people, and that's that's a large span of control. And then we get into centralization versus decentralization. Uh, so uh, if you take a look at Apple, right? Apple's all run out of their head office. Uh, you know, it's centralized, uh, but uh, someone, um, uh, just trying to think, like Procter & Gamble, uh, you know, they may have, um, uh, different businesses that operate almost independently, uh, uh, you know, and 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 on their own, so they have a lot more autonomy. And then formalization, formalization being, you know, how much standardization is there? All right, so that that's uh, that. The, those are the key pieces. So again, you know, um, you can see that I'm highlighting in yellow and stuff. So, you know, um, elements of organizational structures are all in there. All right. Uh, and and then you know here's more about work specialization, you know so it's used to split projects in smaller work activities. So you know the car assembly line is um, 
you know, is a great example. But what what's the downside of of um, you know that that work specialization is that uh, you know some of these jobs in a car manufacturing plant are pretty boring, right? Because it's doing the exact same thing, you know, on a routine basis, and uh, and and that um, you know that, that can lead to you know burnout or you know even you know mental illness for that matter. Uh, chain of command, so you know that's a system for passing instructions and reporting within an organization, right? So you can see here the chain of command is um, is that um, uh, uh, Erico here, you know, has two people that report uh, to 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 himself, and uh, so he will inform these two people. You know, uh, each one of like Samantha now has another two people. Uh, Ricky could have like 10 other people, right? But that's the chain of command. That's, that's how the instructions get down, you know, to the, uh, the, you know, the line component of the organization, you know, where, where, the, where the real work really happens, all right? So you're distributing the power and, and you're supporting with it with knowledge and sharing and, uh, and, and you have this accountability through that kind of chain of command. The unity of command is... Well, um, you can see that the unity command here. Uh, so, so this is uh, uh, you know direct reporting. You know, so so this person doesn't have a second boss, right? This person doesn't have a second boss. This person doesn't have a second boss, right? And that's you know, it, in when you get into a matrix organization, then you do not have unity of command anymore because the you know the person in that matrix has a boss from the area they came from and has a boss who's running the initiative. And, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, span of control, I think I talked about that. So you can see here, this manager has a wider span of control than this manager. He only has two people. This person has, you know, five people and then, you know, a manager of a call center could have a hundred people, all right? So that regulates the number of direct re uh, uh, reports managed by a single supervisor. And again, this all depends on you know how this is brought together. So you know if you've got um, if you've got uh, software systems that can do sort of uh, the managing, well then chances are you're going to see a larger span of control in a, in an organization. Okay, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, okay, where are we here? Okay. Um, uh, just talking about formalization again. So this is how much things are standardized. You know, there's guided by rules and procedures. So those are the kind of things that you want to know. Uh, there's a term called gangplank. So in some organizations, you know, as it as it spreads out, um, some some managers at different levels aren't a lot aren't allowed to even talk to each other. It gets down into what they call silos, and that's. And then when you don't have that kind of communication, then 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 the then the system breaks down. So there's a thing called gangplank, all right, and that's an arrangements where you know uh, uh, managers working at the same level can talk to each other, and and you know they're probably you know in some cases uh, an internal supplier to an internal customer, you know along a process line, right? So gangplank is really important, right, uh, to be able to you know get that communication going and. And and be responsive to uh, what's going on. Uh, different types of of uh, uh, bureaucratic patterns. So a mock bureaucracy um, is that um, uh, sometimes it's an organization, but it's it's um, it's it's really kind of guided by pressure groups that are saying you got to do it this way because uh, you know there's health or whatever. Uh, a representative bureaucracy. That's where you know you even have a union and, and a management uh, uh, team that have to come together uh, to uh, to make sure that things are getting done properly and workers aren't getting exploited and production capability is there so that the organization still remains profitable and and under a triple bottom line approach and then just punishment centered you know and this was you know back in the earlier days there was a lot of this is that hey you know what. Um, you know, you're not doing the job. There's five other people that want that job. Uh, we'll see you, okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll bring someone else in. So so that's what that's all about. Uh, I'm going to talk about McKinsey 7S framework, you know, as we get into the other topics. But but I'll tell you, from my experience, um, 
like McKinsey is one of the premier global consultants around. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the I can't remember the guy's name, Tom, whatever, uh, wrote a book called In Search of Excellence. But this this McKinsey 7 framework is the best way to really understand how the organization is is working. And I use it as an information uh, um, framework to collect information when I'm doing strategic planning, because it really tells you about the culture of the organization. Uh, you know, you evaluate the structure, you, you evaluate the strategy of what's going on, you evaluate to see if the systems are really providing what they need to do to keep the organization uh, uh, um, uh, productive. Uh, the skills really are, they're not so much, you know, actual uh, uh, physical skills. They're 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 more related to what are the competencies that add to a competitive advantage, um, and then the style, the style of the management. And you're going to go through this in assignment number two in terms of, you know, a different style is needed in a different type of organization that's servicing a different type of customer, and and so that in an entrepreneurial style, it's all. You know, it's it's uh, open work, but in a bureaucratic style, it's like you work to you know to these particular rules and guidelines, and then the staff. You know, in terms of what type of people do you bring in, at what competency levels, and how do you train them, and 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 those kind of things. This is one of the most effective ones that I've used, and and I I have to tell you, so you know when when I was at uh, at Telus, uh, uh, I was put in charge of the of the. Um, a strategic planning process for the whole organization, you know, from the from the, the the holding company down to the subsidiaries, down to strategic business units, and and um, and what I did was I actually, uh, uh, you know, redesigned the the uh, the strategic planning process, and that's where I come on to the McKinsey Seven framework because I evaluated a lot of the tools and techniques uh, we needed to be able to. Uh, make sure that, that that strategic planning process was robust and relevant and whatever. And uh, I, I haven't come across anything any better than this, you know, for looking at the internal uh, uh, scanning of the organization, you know, to date. Okay. Uh, and then that, that translates into a star model where you can take a look at, you know, the different aspects of what's going on, uh, you know, the four areas of a structure policy. So, you know, how much specialization, what the shape looks like, you know, the distribution of power. So this is, a, again, a way to, you know, assess, uh, you know, how effective that organization is. Formalization, we talked about. Uh, centralization and decentralization. There's some really good reasons in, in some cases to, um, you know, to, to have a centralization. Like like Apple, I mean, they command the design uh, and, uh, and, and they don't share that with anybody. Uh, uh, but yet they have this, uh, uh, you know, Foxcom out of China that does everything else for them. You know, their logistics and their manufacturing and everything else. Uh, but they have a, you know, a real strong hold. Why? Because they are they own the customer, right? Uh, whereas decentralization, sometimes, you know, especially like in a regional area, uh, you know, you you need, um, you know, if, if people in British Columbia and Canada are you know, are a lot different consumer than, you know, the, the, the consumer in, in Toronto and in Ontario. Uh, so you'll have two organizations, but they'll run uh, differently to be able to satisfy, uh, you know, the needs of their customer base. And that's why you would, you would uh, uh, allow these organizations in decentralization a little more autonomy to be able to have that flexibility. So, you know, you're always, you always have this yin and yang in terms of, standardization versus responsiveness and that's what drives you know the 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 actual structure and if you need more responsiveness chances are you're going to have more of a decentralized organization if you need more standardization you know because of you know uh, for for uh, risk reasons or whatever you're going to have more centralization more control all right so that's how that works okay um so here's a centralized organization. You can see that it's all coming from the top, from the president. Uh, decentralization, you can see now that, you know, here's some uh, geographical decentralization. Uh, and, and then there's some functional stuff going on here because you need, you know, you need experts on the finance piece and you need experts on you know, maybe building the product. So this is likely more on the operations side and this is more likely, you know, on, on the sales 
uh, uh, approach to what's going on. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that. This is a really interesting uh, 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 framework in terms of here. So when is, you know, when is, um, you know, how decentralized should decision making be? All right. So, so what is, you know, if it's important to have responsiveness, remember I told you responsiveness versus standardization, well, then you're going to have decentralization. And that's, you know, this immediate, you know, like really responding to the customer. But now, if it's reliability, you know, if that's really important, especially if there's risk associated with that reliability. Well, then centralization is important and centralization really emphasizes compliance. Everybody has to do the same thing. They have to work to standards. If it's efficiency, again, it's got to be um, centralized. And, and what syndication is, is that those, those bodies that are under that centralized control have standards to meet, right? So the standards in Toronto uh, for uh, toothpaste and at Procter Gamble are the same standards for toothpaste uh, that's being sold in Vancouver, right? So that's what syndication is all about. And this one here, perennity means, you know, a continuous operation. Well, what happens is if you have a continuous operation, um, you know, people start losing sight of, of what they should be doing for head office or losing sight of really, you know, the overall vision. So you need people, you know, in a centralized capacity to say, hey, uh, you know, you're not doing this right, right? And that's where you have centralization, you know, because the, the, the operations become detached, so they need to be put back in line, right? So, so that's, you know, that's kind of gives you the idea of what's going on. Okay. Um, not going to talk about this. Uh, you know, you should know that the terms, you know, the mechanistic versus an organic uh, organization. So mechanistic is, uh, you know, high specialization, rigid departmentalization, clear chain of command. So think of the fire service or the police service. You know, there, there's, there's too much risk involved. So it has to have all those, you know, those conditions and run like a machine, right? Or like the military. Um, you know, uh, and then on, on on the other side, organic, organic really means, you know, adhocracy. There's a lot of collaboration. You know, there's a lot of duties that overlap. Uh, a few rules, you know, it's sort of like, hey, let's get this company going. You know, and when we get larger, then, you know, we'll get into a, a, another area. And, and uh, I, here's a piece of experience that I've had, right? When you're starting a, a new organization, it's organic or it's an ad adhocracy. The worst thing that you can do is when they're coming into this organization, give people titles, right? So what will happen is in a small organization, there might be a, a person that's in charge of production and marketing. And you'll say, well, I'll make you a vice president of, of production and marketing, right? And then what happens is the organization gets larger and then you see you need to bring in somebody new uh, because you need to separate those functions, uh, you know, of production and marketing, because they're getting too big and, and they're getting too more, you know, they're getting more complex. But the person who initially got that title was thinking, "Hey, what are you doing? You're 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 demoting me, all right?" Uh, and, and so that when you bring people into the organization, there has to be an understanding: is that, hey, uh, you're in charge of these areas, no title, right? Uh, and then the the organization is going to get larger. So start thinking about, you know, where your specialty is, and that's where we'll bring in, you know, someone else on the other side with the specialty that you don't have and to make the organization bigger. So that, that those are some of the kind of the, um, you know, the idiosyncrasies of growing an organization and, and not running into issues where, you know, normally what happens when that person, you know, who is looking after production, uh, uh, sorry, operations and marketing, when they feel like they're getting demoted, guess what happens? They leave the organization. You know, they feel hard done by, you know, so there's all those things that you need to, uh, you know, you need to take into consideration. OK, so uh, uh, I, I'm running a little bit out of time here, so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, you, you get to see these, um, you know, functional structure, uh, the functional structure, groups of employees in different departments. So, you know, you'll have a whole pile of marketing people in marketing, you'll have a whole pile of, uh, of finance people in finance. Uh, you'll have a whole pile of people in 
you know, in, in accounting that are accountants. So that's a functional structure. Divisional, like, you know, it could be geographical. Here's the regions, or it could be product, uh, or it could be customer driven, uh, or it could be process driven, you know, and you take a look at, you know, Procter & Gamble. I mean, you know, they've got health, they've got a health division of health products, they've got cleaning products, you know, so they're, and not only that, they have different uh, geographical divisions across countries as well. OK, so so those are the types of departments that you can create. Well, there it is. OK, so so there's Procter & Gamble, you know, like baby products, health, beauty, food, um, and, and then, you know, in into, uh, you know, different uh, department departmentalization. So here's a good illustration of of a, um, a matrix structure. So let's just say that I'm an engineer and I and I come out of engineering and um, my the my my boss says, OK, you're going to work on product A and you're going to report to product A manager. All right. So what do I have? I have my boss in this area and I have my boss in this, you know, in the team. And, and if this doesn't work right, uh, then you start compromising, you know, the viability of this product going through. You know, if the my boss, the engineer decided that, you know, we should be doing uh, things differently that that puts, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, an obstruction in for this actual team. So so it, it, when it works, it works well. Uh, when it doesn't work well, it's a disaster. All right. So uh, that's how they, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, you have multiple uh, uh, supervisors. OK, um, team structure, I think, you know, uh, what you need to understand, all right, is that, they, you know, companies like Apple and Cisco and Google and, and you know, those large ones, they're, they're their team structures, why? Because they're on a, uh, you know, a project orientation. Like, you know, you, you look at Amazon, right? You know, they, they bought, um, you know, uh, the groceries, uh, something foods or, you know, so, so that was a team that looked at the viability, the business viability and a team that's running, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a, the, you know, the grocery part of Amazon. Um, and, and so that, that's where our, you know, that's way our economy is going. So, so the better that you can get, uh, you know, team skills, and that's why I brought in this learning charter, uh, so that you could understand how you need to negotiate to to create a strong team and manage the issues of, of a strong team. And oh, by the way, that learning charter is modeled after a project charter, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a project management. Uh, so it really gives you some some pieces, and then you learn the aspects of team dynamics to to create high performance teams. And you know one of the key things is clear direction, having very uh, succinct uh, uh, goals, and everybody's aligned with those goals, and having the right kind of culture to to support the uh, you know so that the team leader really is a facilitator, and that facilitator actually negotiates, you know, outside of the team to make things, you know, uh, work smooth and and then facilitates inside the team to make sure that those people have what they what they need to be the best at what they're at. And, and then the management style, you know, again, is adapted to the type of project, you know, so if it's a complex uh, project, well, there's going to be a lot more freedom uh, and uh, on the, you know, it's sort of a laissez-faire management style because you have experts working for you as a team uh, leader that you don't have those skills and you need to, you know, you need to uh, rely on their capability to be creative and to be effective. And, and, and so there's all these things that come into play. Okay, network structure, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning of the, um, the webinar, it's, it's gonna be more and more uh, prevalent you know, you're going to be working across time zones. You're going to be working remotely. And here's, you know, where you really need to learn how to, um, you know, uh, to, to uh, you know, work as a team and yet, you know, not uh, not see uh, all that you need to see. All right. So, uh, again, levels of management. Uh, you know, you can see that, you know, that there's three main levels, upper management, middle management, lower level management. and And really, when you take a look at that, the essential activities of the organization are at this lower level uh, of management. And I think I've mentioned this before, but the research, research shows that the, you know, the lower level of management is the most trusted level uh, uh, of managers uh, in the organization. 
And, and if you're an upper management uh, a person or a middle management, if you're not providing the capabilities of that lower uh, level management to provide the information and the support that they need, that's where this trust crumbles and then the organization is not that effective as, as it could be. Um, so there's different things I'd like you to, to go through this piece, but ultimately where we're going, you know, with the organizational structure is, uh, you know, we're going to get into, you know, the, um, the value chain and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, Michael Porter, and this is coming in, in the next activities. And you can see where, you know, these are primary activities and these are support activities. And this is how you, you know, you drive the, the activities to be able to produce uh, quality and, and, um, and profitability going through. So that's kind of our, you know, our next lead off to uh, where that goes. And I think that's really what I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things that are highlighted in yellow that I'd like you to kind of go through. Uh, but, um, but I think um, that's where we're going to end it. And, and again, chapter five is very important. You know, have a, have a look at it with your team before you do, uh, you know, uh, participation activity 4B. Study that as well. And it's a part of the other uh, 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 e-text uh, PowerPoint presentations that, that you're going to need to uh, go through for test number one. And, and you can go to the outline, the course outline, and make sure that you cover them all. So, you know, chapter one of the e-text PowerPoints, chapter three, there's two supplemental ones, 1B and 1C, and then chapter five, are going to be the things that you need to cover for this test. Okay. All right. Any questions at all? Sorry for all the talking. There was a lot of content here. Um, you know, next time around, I'll again. I, I hope to be up to speed on. Uh, I, I think that these breakout rooms are going to work, and we'll get a little more discussion. But uh, please, you know, send me send me questions. You know, email me or go on to the. Um, you know, the, uh, the discussion board, uh, ask Coach Gary, and I'd be happy to uh, to outline that stuff. And I'll put out a message as well about um, about the test being extended, you know, to uh, October 3rd, uh, 8 a.m. start to uh, October 4th, 11 p.m. Uh, uh, finish for access. OK, and put your, uh, you know, your your lockdown browser and uh, and web webcam test tested. OK, talk to you later then. And stop the recording. And uh, and also you'll see the link, you know, by tomorrow on um, on where to pick up this. Um,